Hello, welcome to the podcast. This is Bristol Real. I'm Val. I'm Jerome. And I'm Tom. So this is the first of a two-part podcast, actually. What are we talking about today? We were talking about the current stage technology in artificial intelligence, and we were looking at the future applications of it and the consequences of those applications. And we d- dabbled a bit in ethics, but we tried to stop going into too much, because as you say, we're doing a second part next week. Yeah, which is going to be on ethics. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Awesome. Okay, hope you like this one. Okay. Is it recording? Excellent. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, do you want to start by saying what you have on it? Oh, we're starting now. All right, let's start with the definition of AI. The, the term was originally coined by, I think it was, his name is John McCarthy. I, I don't know. Is that right? Yeah, no. It's, how it's, how it's, long it's ago was open. this? Because John this is... McCarthy coined the term in 1956. Okay. And that's, I, I th- many people say that's about when conventional, contemporary AI research began. So okay. That's where it originated. Um, AI research being research into what? What are you, what are you saying? Creation of an intelligent agent, I think, is one of the most general definitions. Wait, is that, so have you, have you got his actual definition? The actual def- I don't think he was the one who defined it in the same way. Because I've got a definition, but I don't know if it's his Well, let's go for this okay. one. Let's, go, let's try that one. So it's the idea of creating computers that are able to complete tasks that require intelligence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sort of okay. Idea. And intelligence itself is, sounds pretty uh, pretty broad yeah. as a topic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the com- yeah, it was John McCarthy in 1956, okay. and he defined it. I don't think it was him that defined it like this, but this is how people define it. The Wikipedia defines it now is the study and design of intelligent agents. Intelligent, an intelligent agent being a system that sees its environment and takes actions that maximizes its chances of success. Right. <laughs> All right. That's a bit long. But... Yeah, sees, no, it's, sees its environment. I wouldn't say that's necessary. Uh, you need to take a sensory input in order to be able to process any data about the actual world. Which is what an intelligence does. Really? Well, what well, well, you? I don't know. What about like computer algorithms though, that work using harvesting big data, the, that sort of thing? Those, yeah, they're taking big data, which is a sensory input. So that's you'd perceived, say that's even though your environment, yeah. even though the environment is totally digital. Oh yeah, it doesn't. Okay. It's regardless of what kind of envir- environment it is. It's like running a simulation, for example. You can still have inputs within that simulation into whatever your brain is. Okay. But we'll get into that in a second. Right. So I, I, we can split. Um, the idea of AI into two areas yep. so weak AI and strong AI most of the kind of development of AI has taken place in, in the area of weak AI mm-hmm. which is things like Siri chess program which is just using software to complete a one specific task yep. um, but I think what we're going to be concentrating more on today is strong AI which is actually trying to get computers to think on their own mm-hmm. and Using using their intelli- own intelligence, upgrade themselves, and then, yeah. Yeah, so, sort of more emulating the human brain. Exactly, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, While exceeding it as super intelligence. Well, yeah, so, we'll get onto that later, because yeah. I've got some, we some stuff on that. that. Uh, within AI, you uh, have... We'll talk about Neat versus Scruffy AI. For after that, so from uh, general AI, neat versus scruffy is the sense that with neat AI, you have an elegant solution to what intelligence actually is, and then therefore, as you can express it in a particular way, you're able to verify, uh, validify, all of that sort of stuff to do with it, and it's a belief that intelligence can be condensed down into this single set of algorithms, whatever. But in contrast to that, you also have the scruffy okay. uh, section, which you believe that intelligence isn't like that, and that you can't have an elegant solution and that it's intrinsically not perfect, and that we use all sorts of really, really uh, unorthodox methods in order to establish things. Unorthodox from the perspective of logic, that is. Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah. are these are these kind of schools of thought about that? Yeah, they are schools of thought. Right, okay. um, personally, I think neat AI is better in the long run because, as you know, the future of life letter, which is, I think, the, <clears throat> the signing of that, because you saw that massive uprising, not uprising, sorry, that massive um, uproar about AI at the end of last year. Okay. With, like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. Well, it's been for the past kind of six, seven, eight months. Really. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. do you not know initiated that? Because I, I was, was just about to ask. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think anything specific. Oh no! It was um, for Stephen Hawking. It was the what that film uh, with Johnny Depp, wasn't it? It was straight after that came out. He released the letter. Uh, Transcendent. Transcendence. Okay. okay. So What's even that? even though it was a bit, bit of fiction, yeah. it kind of inspired it. Really? No way. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I yeah. think that's why that's they really released it at the time because the the film was where some some researcher uploaded his mind to a computer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that was basically AI. The premise of it. Okay. And so he 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 kind of released the letter. Um, 
sort of building off the momentum in that film mm -hmm. and saying that you can't just think of AI as sci-fi. It's actually going to come to yeah. that point. We need mm -hmm. to find okay. a way of addressing all the uh, problems that will come with it. So what sort of things were mentioned in this letter then? The, le these? the letter which was signed by Elon, or, yeah, signed by Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and various other academics, yeah, several of they mentioned, they broke it down into two broad sections in terms of short-term research priorities and long-term research priorities. And the short-term ones were then, there's a subsection of economics, ethics and law, robust AI research, um, those being the three. Then within that, you had various facets. I won't go through all of them, and I recommend you read the letter itself, but they're talking about the effect on the labour market, so people okay. losing their jobs because of AI, um, effects on other parts of the economy, so looking at financial trading markets. Obviously, if you have a super intelligence that has massive connotations for wealth and power, and especially economic disparity, which we'll talk about that sort of stuff next week. Yeah. Uh, then under ethics and law, you have autonomous vehicle legislation, so that's incredibly relevant, obviously, here in Bristol. As you've been saying, Val, there's the uh, Ventura yeah. Yeah. project. Well, we'll probably talk about that in a bit as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then talking about privacy, so how those sorts of systems would handle sensitive information, professional ethics for computer scientists, which is quite interesting. So sort of in the same way that, that doctors... Or medics take yeah. um, it's have interesting like an oath. They're talking about implementing something like that for computer scientists. Then finally, under robust AI research, this is what I was actually talking about a moment ago. You have verifying your research, so demonstrating that it does what you want it to, so it performs in the way desired. Then also security, so protecting the system from or from unauthorized users. Then on top of that, you also have a uh, control problem. The control problem is really, really interesting. That's absolutely fascinating. And many people, that's um, one of the main things. So you have that intelligence explosion effect, where mm -hmm. if you create a system that continually improves itself, then it will improve itself at an exponential rate. I yeah, think it's that, called the singularity. Yeah, yeah, yeah they call it singularity, but the letter itself, I think, strays, doesn't like to use yeah, that term. The, 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 in the short term, the impact, term. Yeah. But yeah, it depends on who controls it, but in the long term, it depends whether it can be controlled as I thought, all, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that incredible. That that's actually yeah. the people like Stephen Hawking actually saying that's something that's feasible. Yeah. Because you always you always see it in sci-fi. Yeah. But you don't think of it actually happening. Well, I personally don't. I, I think the the main point of the letter was Stephen Hawking was issuing a warning. About, it was a warning about it, AI. It wasn't. It wasn't just a warning. It, there's a really. Uh, I, mean, I think that's why he put it out. It's, it's a warning, and that I think he, the quote he used was. Uh, uh, he, he kind of talks about how we're the smartest thing on the planet right now, mm -hmm. but when that when that's not true anymore, we have no idea what's going to happen. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That would be the greatest moment in human history. Ever. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually, whilst we're searching this, I felt absolutely terrified at times, yeah. and like really, really anxious because the thought of something being so definitively more intelligent. I mean, you have academics on the planet. And you think, yeah. Okay, they're really good at stuff, but I'm also good at these other things mm -hmm. that they might not be quite so good at. Mm -hmm. But. With a super intelligence, you wouldn't have anywhere near that sort of... You would feel so belated in the sense that anything you could do would always be second best, regardless of what it was. Yeah. Hey, again, he, he talked about how they would uh, outsmart financial markets, yeah. out, out invent researchers, and... Um, what was yeah. the other one? Uh, oh, yeah, creating weapons we cannot even understand. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. No, that's, that's oh, awful. actually, that came up under the letter itself. Uh, yeah. Autonomous weaponry. Yeah. Which is so... It's like defining things like... Uh, human control over autonomous weaponry and what is actually defined as an autonomous weapon. And they, like it's, he, uh, they also talked about how it's difficult to actually understand what that means because when, when people think of AI, they think of you know someone, a, a dumb person comparing to Einstein. They're still, yeah, it's still yeah. human, but it won't be like that at all. It'd be like comparing a wolf to to Einstein, whereas a wolf can doesn't even can't even comprehend how a gun works or anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what AI would be to yeah to humans. Okay. Well, let's not talk talk too much about the ethics because we'll do that. Yeah, time. yeah. We'll, we'll talk we'll, we'll talk more week. about how that's incredible the technology and fascinating is. It is. So, has anyone got like if we're going to kick it off with some interesting things we've been looking at? We've all been looking at various projects like yeah. Has anyone got start off talking about the autonomous vehicle stuff? That's relevant. Uh, we're in Bristol. Uh, Bristol real. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it does sound too excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I don't know. I I, I haven't. I, I don't know that much about the. The UK's driverless cars. Was it they're investing 19 million? Something like that, but I mean, it's being spearheaded by Google's 
autonomous cars. Yeah, isn't it? which which I, 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 I was amazed. Yeah, yeah, I was amazed to find that these things have already driven millions of miles in California. Yeah, the cars. <laughs> yeah, they say that they see them on the highways and stuff all the time. In California. Me, yeah, so. Are the Bristol ones actually related to that? Or no, are they no, no, they're completely. All, all the ones in the UK are completely okay. UK based. Are they? Nothing they're all different companies then. So the London ones yeah. different to the yeah. Bristol ones different to the. London. They're up, they're they're only, it's only Bristol London? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Two, uh, I think there's one in Coventry, isn't it? Maybe. I, I think, think there's various projects going on. Right. Well, yeah, the, the, the three that got supported, I think, last week, I think it was Thursday, the article came out. Um, it was the one in Bristol, which is a bit, it's different to the other two, where the, the other two are electric based um, driverless cars. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're built from scratch to be driverless cars. Whereas the Bristol one is just taking a military Jeep and a Putting all the cameras on top of it mm-hmm. and sensors to make it a driverless. Which car. I find quite interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm yeah, not sure yeah, you guys are as convinced yeah. with that. The idea of buying a kit that made your car autonomous is yeah. very strange. Yeah, That's well, not worrying, looking, looking at looking at the pictures, happen. like you said, it's pretty scruffy at the moment. Yeah. Pretty rough and ready, but you can refine it. You yeah. could you could make it into a very clean module. I mean, those photos are from now, but it, um, until it gets onto the road in three years, we don't know how how it's going to look. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it might be much neater. Yeah, so keep an eye out for it in 2015, I guess. 2018, sorry. 17. It's 17? Yeah. Oh, okay. So the one in Bristol. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is that early 2017 or late? I don't know. All right. I think for each of these, each of these we should say at the end, like, do we think it's going to catch on? How well do we think it's going to catch on? So driverless I, 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 cars... I think driverless cars are... are driverless cars, yeah, we were talking about this the other day. They're going to happen. Everybody's going to happen. Like, everybody, it's so obvious. Everybody lo- I'm sure everybody loves driving and stuff, but it just... When you have a driverless car, it makes no sense to drive in terms of mm-hmm. safety and yeah. all that. Mm-hmm. Well, 95% of accidents are caused by driver exactly, human error. Yeah. The Google cars haven't crashed a single time. Yeah. You can't, you can't argue with that. Mm. So. Mm-hmm. It's also far more social in the sense that if you if you have this autonomous car, then you don't need to focus it's on driving. It's brilliant, yeah. It so, almost becomes sort of like a lounge, except between places, and your your productivity will go up. Yeah, so like exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking... Maybe you don't even need to buy your own car. Maybe yeah, you just exactly. Have like a, that would be fascinating. Sort of like Uber, but for driverless cars. Yeah. yeah. So instead of actually owning Definitely, a car... Yeah, well, they got, they're going to all be built on... They, it could well be one company that runs all these. I'm thinking yeah. this is something I'll talk about later, but it could well just be one company run the entire thing, in which case you could hop in any bloody car you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you pay your money using your contactless card... Mm. Yeah. So like an Oyster card. This sounds. This is great to me. But yeah, it does sound really cool. I think I would certainly want to use it, but that figure came out... Uh, about whether people would use it or not. I don't know if it's on BBC or The Verge, but fifty uh, percent of people said they wouldn't. Lack of trust use in, in the technology. Car. But that's because they they don't understand. It's like it's a lack of trust yeah. because they don't know anything about yeah. it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be too wary of that because people say that about any technology, yeah, I mean, yeah. any new technology. It's, ju- it's just it's not even out for the public to use. It's just one of those kind of secret projects. Yeah, that mm-hmm. I think one that's quite interesting is the same technology is going to be applicable when you think driverless cars. You think cars you think humans sit in them and go to their parents house or whatever but this same technology is like can be transferred to any scale so kind of like lorries transporting goods around how much more efficient will the, will the kind of manufacturing industry be mm-hmm. things in factories well, yeah. you could you could you could exactly, play it you yeah. could apply it to ships and planes and like it would basically yeah. be the same technology that would have massive connotations to the labor market there wouldn't it and so you all your lorry drivers and pilots yeah wow well apparently 70 million people worldwide are, are employed to transport people and wow. things around so that's wow. that's kind of every single one of them could feasibly be replaced by the same algorithm, yeah. slightly tweaked. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, we're, we're not going to comment on whether that's good or <laughs> yeah, bad yet. We'll, yeah. we'll leave that till next time. Next um, Has anyone else got a good one? Other projects, yeah. I mean, there's the higher level projects in terms of simulating the human brain. So uh, we're talking about application, general applications of AI. So <coughs> simulating the human brain. So we've got to, Watson, IBM Watson. Yeah, those are ones, but there's um, the actual research projects, projects which may be associated with them are the Brain Initiative in America, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then there's the uh, what's it called? Isn't, isn't that Human um, Brain Project? Is that is Paul on that? Paul Allen? Possibly, I don't know. I think he's working on that, isn't he? The guy yeah. from Microsoft. It's Paul Allen, isn't it? the guy from Microsoft? He set up with Bill Gates. Quite possibly. I have no yeah, idea. I think that's what he's working on right now. The uh, brain initiative. Yeah, th- those two prob. I don't know if the brain initiative is actually ongoing yet. I know the human brain project's been running for a few years now, and they're effectively simply trying to map simply uh, <laughs> mapping <laughs> the entire human brain and the activity of every single neuron in there, which yeah. is ludicrous. And I actually did the calculations in terms of the amount of data. 
yeah. that would produce. So uh, people estimate, or scientists estimate, that it would generate about 300 exabytes of data, which is 300 times 10 to the 18. And like is, that per, is this per what? Per... This is per year. Per year. <laughs> and it will run for 10 years. And then I did data volume calculations based on the size of a regular hard drive. And it turns out it would take up, I think it's about 1.72 times 10 to the 12 data volume teacups <laughs> over that time. And obviously then on top of that, you've got the massive problem of actually trying to go uh, use addresses in that data. So think about how long it takes to transfer something from your hard drive, and then you've got it with like an absolutely obscene number of those. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, so. but... You, you te- you're you thinking of these in terms of the, the current technology oh, yeah, the, the actual yeah, technology yeah, I, I the by necessity the human brain it works in a different way yeah. every, like that it's it's parallel computing as opposed to linear yeah. computing mm-hmm. so how we're, does that work we're still basically? so far from understanding how the brain works yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so crazy co- co- it's really really thought and the, the, it's, we're so far from understanding it yeah and consciousness it, that's actually one of the really interesting um, connotations for this research so if you can emulate the human brain then you can you have a simulation toolbox for psychology and neuroscience, mm-hmm. and that is has enormous con- connotations for philosophy as well. So, yeah, taking the mystery out of what makes us tick, in a sense. Which yeah, is, again, well, once we odd. get to the point where we actually understand the brain, you'll be able to get rid of mental disabilities and things like that as well. Yeah, you, you yeah. Yeah. Able to, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing these. Like there's a lot of research in all sorts of areas that are all focused around learning what the brain, how the brain works. Mm-hmm. It could be for automating our cars, or it could be for curing brain cancer. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned IBM Watson, didn't you? Yeah, um, really fast stuff on that. Did you see the video where he uh, it won the Jeopardy against yeah. the champion? Yeah, well, that, I think that it was his original was application. That was the kind of original application demonstration. Yeah. But now they're planning to use it for. Uh, providing unique care to cancer patients, I think. Yes, it? what yeah. was it? Lung cancer treatment. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Which is really, really good. I lo- it's great to see or- uh, it already finding applications in places like the healthcare industry mm-hmm. where it would actually be transformative. Yeah. So this is what what's this is the better type of AI, isn't it? What's strong AI? Strong AI. So this is an example of strong AI. It basically, you can create apps for it. It's like an operating system. Almost. This is how I'm thinking of it. Watson's like an operating system that you can create apps for. So it's got this. Have this. Jeopardy mm. app. Yeah. And it's, it's probably pretty Wait, contorted, um, but... Isn't Watson application-specific in the sense that it was a database and then you take information from that database and then use it? Well, but I think it can be used in several places at once. It's It kind of gets ported over. It's, it's used in, like, however many locations at once. It's just, <laughs> like, a, it's just a working algorithm, like... Well, it's actually, not one single computer. I don't know. Is, is Watson strong AI? No, no, I think it's, it's weak AI. Would you, would you say it's weak you, you can write applications for it and you've got that enormous uh, process. Because okay. it's not actually doing... So it's not, it's not the actual human cognition. Yeah, it's, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. That's interesting yeah. then. Yeah. But apparently in this place in the lung cancer treatment ward, 90% of nurses now follow its advice. <laughs> That's amazing. Which is incredible. Yeah. But I don't know whether it's just giving obvious advice most of the time, like this person is ill. Or, or whether it's something that's actually genuinely been really useful, mm-hmm. which I, I probably have an inkling that it is. I mean, yeah. all, all it needs to do is be more, have a higher percentage of being right than humans, and then... Yeah, it, exactly, that's, that's... It doesn't need to be right every single time. Yeah, that's the, probably for the key it, thing with it. For it to replace human doctors. From an economic point of view, that's yeah. true. I think, same with driverless cars, if it's better than the current alternative, even if it's not perfect, it's going to be, it's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know about that. It's... In the Future of Life letter, again, they were talking about autonomous vehicles and saying even if you half the number of deaths deaths on crashes related to car accidents, you would still end up with... Uh, you Say you had 40,000 crashes mm. with drive uh, cars with drivers, mm-hmm. and then you switch over to autonomous vehicles and you ended up with 20,000 crashes. In the first instance, you might only get a couple of lawsuits. In the second instance, you might end up with 20,000 lawsuits. Because people it's all attributable to the same blame. thing, I exactly. suppose. Yeah. So if you, I really do think you have to have like a ninety nine point nine 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 percent success rate in order for people to actually upset, uh, accept AI, because mm. we have come to expect so much from our technology that it's not good enough if it doesn't yeah. work. Well, I, I, I think you were saying that was a, a half. Was that halfing the the numbers of deaths? I think it would be, be a lot be better than, than, that. than that, obviously. But, but even so, you would still end up with lawsuits that wouldn't necessarily exist because people are so much more inclined to blame technology rather than putting things down to human error. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But we'll go into that more again next week <laughs> when we talk about AI ethics. There's a lot. Yeah, I think yeah. any one of these naturally goes on to talking about the ethics yeah. of it. But yeah. So, other projects. 
Have either of you seen the Open Worm Project? I've probably seen the name, but I've yeah, not. I didn't it's look simulate, into it. It's, they got this Lego robot. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. So this, yeah. Was, this is an example of uh, artificial... I think I've got it on my reading list. Oh, okay, yeah. We'll, we'll bring that up. Um, yeah, this was an example of neuro... Uh, sorry. Uh, let's just go... Neuron simulation in uh, robotics. So sort of similar to this IBM's one. Synapse chip. Yeah, that is the exact one. So what we're looking at here is a Lego robot that's been given a set of neurons which take input from sensors and rather than having an algorithm in between the sensors and the motors you have this reinforcement system where it waits particular signals and then feeds them onto the motors. So say if it were to get a really really strong signal in front of it then it would feed it to one motor in particular would get a massive signal and it would get sent back. And it, I actually felt kind of disturbed watching it because I knew it was a flatworm brain that was being simulated. For that. <laughs> that freaked me out a bit. But that's only yeah. got 302 neurons in it. Um, in a, actually, a flatworm only has 302 neurons. It's a one millimeter flatworm. Yeah, which <laughs> yeah. But the, yeah, I recommend watching the video. Uh, it's called Open Worm. But this actually brings me on to another topic, which is the time when we will be able to simulate the human brain in terms of neuron. Now, the human brain I think has uh, 100 billion. Neurons. Which is a step up from, from 302. <laughs> Very much so. But because if you take uh, our ability to simulate neurons and actually these brain networks as being proportional to computational power in this, in, measured in calculation per second, mm -hmm. then what you end up with is... Um, hold on, I've got the data here. Yeah, it is on this page. Sorry to break the flow. We'll wait. Yeah. Okay, this is it. Yeah, so 10 to the 16 calculations per second formed by the human brain. Uh, that's a figure by Ray Kurzweil. Kurzweil. Which is going to vary. Kurzweil, it's going to vary massively. How do you know him? I've got his book. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Yeah, sorry. Mispronounced. Yeah. Hey! Excellent coincidence. So clearly, yeah. But he says 10 to the 16 calculations per second are formed by the human brain. On average. And on, it's probably on, better, on average, yeah, yeah. obviously. <laughs> Um, but then the fastest supercomputer we have at the moment, which is the Tianhe 2, uh, uh, that forms 36 quadrillion, which is 36 times 10 to the 15. Uh, I did this supercomputer takes up 720 meters squared and huh. requires 24 megawatts worth of power. Now, to put that in perspective, the human brain takes up what? I don't know, 0 0.001 meters squared <laughs> of space, less than that even, um, and it requires 20 watts to. Run. Now, to put that in perspective even further, the human brain therefore has 330,000 times better computer power, computing power density per unit power and 20,000 times better computing power density per unit area, which is obviously... That's yeah. Well, if we, if we were doing Moore's Law with that, how long would that take? <laughs> that's, to yeah, this is what I think that's an interesting one. to compare it with. So, uh, f in th the cost of that is absolutely insane. I haven't got the figure here, but it's obviously in the millions of dollars. And what he did was by comparing it with Moore's Law and, like I was saying, taking uh, your ability to simulate it uh, being proportional to computational <coughs> power, yeah. you end up with a human brain for $1,000 by 2025, which I'm incredibly sceptical of. 2025? But, yeah. But this is dependent on the fact that you have an ability to implement that computing power. So that brings us on to ways to actually simulate the human brain. And there are three schools of thought at the moment, which are statistical ways. Mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of similar to behavior, behaviorism in psychology. So taking, learning from experience, in effect. So reinforcing particular behavior patterns based on uh, success rate of past actions. Uh, another method of doing it is by using oh, symbolic AI. So that's anticipating absolutely every single situation that could possibly occur. Which sounds a bit wasteful element. to me. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, these methods, some of these methods have enormous throughput. And people are very critical of that, especially I, the neat school of thought generally doesn't really appreciate the idea of taking so much data and just grabbing certain patterns in it, because obviously that requires massive amounts of computing power and storage. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you simulate the human brain using simple algorithms? Mm. I... Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Probably... Like, they were talking about the software here. How does the hardware work? Are, they, are, they, are people trying to use the same hardware that they currently use? There's a great video on... They're not using the same hardware um, that we currently use. Well, IBM haven't been. I think because our brains don't work like computers. Now, computers, yeah. a computer a processing chip runs on... is 
built on something called the von Neumann architecture. So that's linear processing. So you have a linear stream of data and it runs through and it forms these operations sequentially. Now our brains don't do that. What they do is they take multiple inputs, so sensory inputs, say touch, smell, taste, whatever, then our brain fires particular neurons and these just like go off in a massive chain of reactions all at once. Then we we look at the end result of that and we perform particular action. Now I'm sorry if any neuroscientists are listening, they're probably wanting to butch me now, but that's <laughs> my very, very limited understanding of how it actually works. Now there have there has been development of chips like these. This is where I've been I think I mentioned it a couple of times before, the IBM Synapse chip. Mm -hmm. Now, the synapse chip works in a similar way to this. It's almost like if you imagine having a complete array of panels, and within these panels you have particular nodes which act like neurons. Now, you take your sensory input, a couple of those fire, those get sent off to other little panels, and within those panels it fires more sensors. Uh, if you go on the IBM Research website, there's a really good video of this, and it talks about that. But this isn't the von Neumann architecture, so all of the conventional programming techniques, like say using C or Java or HTML or whatever, that won't work like with that that chip. Right. Right. So instead, they've had to develop a new programming language, which is called, which I think is developed by True North, and I think it, it uses something called Corlets. So rather than specifying how the program itself runs, you specify specify the input and the output of it, sort of like a black box. Yeah. Now you build these Corlets on top of each other and on top of each other till you end up with something like a Russian doll. And with that Russian doll, you have simulated your brain, so to speak. But yeah, Easy. Yeah. It, and, but what they, one of the really interesting things about this is because we've become so accustomed to using von Neumann architecture and writing programs in a very linear way, pe um, really good computer programmers, they're really pissed off with this uh, program language because they don't understand it because it is so different. Yeah. So we definitely need to see a uh, convention shift in the fields of programming and computer architecture in order for you to see proper application, proper implementation Definitely. of artificial intelligence technology. Yeah. So I'd, I'd say that if we're talking about emulating the human brain, we can't feasibly say that that's ever really been done before. Because oh. that technology hasn't been created. Yeah. That kind of physical hardware hasn't been created. Yeah. So anything else has been a linear kind of approximation yeah, of this parallel so. architecture. Um, that actually is, yeah, the simulation thing, there's several ways to do that. Have you got anything on the mind of you? The simulation uh, on ways of methods of simulating the human brain's behavior. I know that I know the closest that they get at the moment is through graphic process like GPUs. Ah uh, yes, GPUs. You saw that article. Yeah. There? yeah. So using, did you see this? No. You've seen, you know, Google did that cat thing. Okay. Uh, well, that, this is cool. Yeah, this is actually quite interesting. Is this is this strong or weak? This is I would call that would weak. It's weak, weak AI because you're identifying cats. You're not doing anything but identifying but cats. But it, it could identify other things, couldn't it? They haven't made a strong AI yet. Okay, no. right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's strongish. Yeah. Middle. <laughs> to but anyway, extent, what's, yeah. what's, what's this thing doing? So, uh, the Google Cat Recognition Project, or something, I can't remember the exact name of it. I think it was, e it was something as daft as that. Yeah, it was something crazy like that. It used a thousand computers spread across the world, so cloud computing, and each of these computers had 16 processors, and what it did is it set, it was a program that was designed to identify cats in videos. Right. And one of the issues I had with this was that every time a server broke down, the calculations would slow down and the the system would just go to pot. Um, so what a gentleman did instead was, or people have started doing instead, is using GPUs, which if you know about CPUs and GPUs, GPUs are basically really, really good CPUs in a sense. Again, yeah. computer science... They, they work it in a lot more parallel way. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, which is a step closer. <clears throat> which is a step closer. So you have these tightly integrated systems which can perform calculations far quicker and therefore have a better computational volume, uh, computational power per unit volume and per unit cost. And in terms of logistics, it also makes a lot more sense to have all your processes in one place rather than scatter throughout the yeah. world. Yeah. So yeah, people start taking the approach of using GPUs on CPUs, but then on top of that you have other projects like, uh, hold on. Well, just as, just as a side note, Facebook face recognition uses GPUs. Ah, yeah, yeah, the face recognition. So it, is get, it does get used actually professionally. Yeah. It's amazing how many how like how many applications of so called artificial intelligence are commonplace these days. Mm -hmm. People, it's actually in some places it is getting introduced quite yeah. heavily and has been for a while. Yeah. So it's not of the future anymore. Yeah, like but like I was saying before, you have different you do have those different levels of application specific intelligence. So yeah, I mean, the modern stuff you like you say the Facebook photo recognition, person recognition, is absolutely awesome. But yeah. then. Uh, as I said before we started the podcast, a calculator is, would strictly speaking, be a type of application-specific intelligence. So 
It's not as science fictiony as people might initially conceive. Obviously, yeah. but as you've said several times now, Val, general AI is so much beyond specific AI. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is certainly something we've is, is it ever going to be possible to get full on general AI? Or is it going to have some limitations? Well, if we do that, we will be very the human that. brain is The human brain isn't general AI. It can't do. We can't do everything. Oh no, that's how you define. No, no. Uh, the sense in I know we can't do everything, but general AI in the sense that you have the capacity to for thought. Yeah, capacity for thought. Yeah, like, that's a really good way. Of Isn't that it. a bit of a woolly definition? It's yeah, but by def like our brains are sort of <laughs> pretty woolly, woolly. In the way that our intelligence is structured. This is one of the issues of the field actually being able to define what intelligence is yeah. and how to parameterize it. Parameterize it. Yeah, no, I mean like the th- the. To kind of differentiate weak eye, you can think of stuff like fuzzy logic. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you come across that. So it. it's it's like, like if you're heuristics. If, yeah, if we're sitting in a room and I say uh, you're sitting next to the window, and I, I'm like I'm, I say it, it's really hot in here. You you can you understand <clears throat> that? Okay. To mm-hmm. open the window. So it's not quantified. Whereas yeah, whereas right. weak AI wouldn't be able to tell that. Yeah. You're just saying you're just putting input <laughs> saying. The room okay. Is hot. So it's sort of like common sense and all yeah, that sort of things that aren't actually based on logic, but. Uh, we it's like cultural implications and that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to ask where the morals are based on logic again. We're going to go there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, not, th- it's, it's, it's the logical reaction though. It's, it is a logical reaction, but it's in the not, sense that there are other things yeah. like say uh, idiomatic expressions. Yeah. Being able to interpret those correctly, so saying a completely different kettle of fish, would be very difficult to interpret logically. Mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. I think that you'd, you'd have like we we don't in, we kind of only learn that because we learnt it because we got told it at some point. So mm-hmm. a computer would just get told it in the same way. I'm not sure you could ever understand the idioms per but se. Yeah, I think yeah, like, I humans think, can't no, do no, that. You could, uh, you could in a sense. So like when you're talking to people, you still understand what they're getting at, even if you don't understand the nuances okay. of right. the idiom. That's so, actually something I part of my essay. I did some talks at school about AI. I went to um, Wired in 2013. Oh, cool. And one of the guys there was from the MIT Media Lab uh, called Deb Roy. He's, he was studying, he does a lot of stuff with AI and uh, cognition, things like that. One of his projects, which, which he talked about, was called the Human Speech Own Project. Mm-hmm. So from the day his, well, the idea of the project was to try and understand how children learn language. And to try and then implement that into computers and help them learn right. language, um, because you have to do that because by you can't just input definitions into a computer because definitions by definition are circular. So to, okay. to define a word, you have to use other words, which then have to be defined using other yeah. words, which then kind of goes back in a loop together. Which always annoyed me about using the dictionary. Yeah, uh, and so he wa- he 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 wanted to try and go through the. The, the way of teaching computers how to learn language, like children. So what he did was, from the day his son was born and came into the house, he had cameras in every single room oh with a microphone in every single room. <laughs> <laughs> and all the data was streamed to the MIT Media Lab con- cons- constantly. And a quarter of a million hours were recorded and processed by PhD students in, in MIT. And... Uh, they came to the conclusion that, like like you were just saying, that the the words and the things and, and physical things aren't directly linked. Mm-hmm. They're linked together by the actual thoughts. So and your experiences with them. So, um, like one of the things you found is that it's, it seems obvious, but until you actually look at it, so the parents really when, when their when their children are born, they really simplify their language. So. Um, they can gradually build that up until they can say the word properly. Yeah. And you, things like um, the word water will most will be learned most of the time inside the kitchen or inside the bathroom. So the environment has an effect on um, actual actually learning the language. So you have to you have to go through the, the experience of being with the physical thing yeah. rather than just inputting <coughs> definitions into it. Mm-hmm. So that's another way of of doing that. Yeah. That's interesting. So then you're le- so learning by association, in effect. Yeah, yeah. by experience. Yeah. Well. I think yeah, a computer would understand a label and a definition, which is what the dictionary says the language is. But it's not. There's a meaning in between there. Yeah. There's kind of t- in the middle of that sandwich. There is a meaning. Like word, words in themselves don't mean anything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the connection to the actual physical thing. Yeah. And to connect them, you have to 
yeah. kind of amusing thought. Yeah. Well, I personally can't comprehend how a computer could do that. Yeah. But people who are clever. Yeah, that, that's yeah the thing. you mean you'd need to bootload experience into it, surely? If and you would have, have fully functioning AI, general AI, assuming it would be possible, immediate, so you'd just run out of the box, you'd need to have, before that happened, you'd need to run experiences into it so that it would be able to understand those you would have, yeah, that have something about. to which uh, which to link it to yeah, mm. yeah. It, you would almost have to bring it up like a child yeah, not just in terms of language you would have to bring it up like a child maybe in 20 years you buy like a, a tiny robot yeah. that, it's literally that like, a, a, tam- that it's like a, a Tamagotchi <laughs> <laughs> yeah that has a, the language of a well has no language like a, a newborn and then you just kind of grow you teach it, teach it like that's a child. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the most likely way it's going to happen. And then by the time you're 40, 50, 60 years old, the AI is 100, 200 times <laughs> smarter than you've ever yeah. been. Yeah, well, this is this is a thing. This is the idea that, like, it's not actually, it's not limited in the same way we are. And you say we can't comprehend how intel- how intelligent they can actually become yeah. because computers just keep getting smarter. It's like, as it's, it's exponential. Yeah. It's the law of increasing returns. If something gets more smart, it gets more data, it gets more smart, it gets... Like and big data around the internet is just increasing in artificial intelligence. Yeah. Like so, the original algorithm, if it's done right, it doesn't actually have to be that simple, that complicated, I suppose. But it kind of complicates itself as it goes on, which is yeah. I see. I that yeah. I agree with that uh, way of doing it. I think in the sense that the original algorithm isn't that complex in terms of it, it's quite beautiful and elegant. Yeah. And then it manages. It's like a It'll be very sort of like a box. Oh, yeah. Sort of like a box <laughs> compared to how itself, it's going to yeah. end up. But. Yeah, yeah. It's complex in the sense that it's incredibly profound. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, we're talking about strong artificial intelligence, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Yeah, and then you have first you have to somehow <laughs> give it thought. Yeah. Yeah. Which is you have to give it yeah. that kickstart that yeah. like means I wonder that if, you can I learn things. I wonder if there's a central equation to that. I wonder if there's like an equals mc squared to that. Hmm. Or like a certain central thing that we, obviously it wouldn't be a simple equation like that, but maybe there is this kind of equation that creates consciousness. Mm-hmm. Would, that would be bizarre. That'd be, that'd it be. would be really bizarre, wouldn't it? It just you need an equation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say it's probably going to have more than three terms. But <laughs> <laughs> how how would you feel about that? How would you feel? How would you feel to know that you your entire your entire intelligence could be kind be of humble quantified by a single a single equation, albeit probably a very very big one. Yeah, it'd be humbling. Like, well, it, we don't want to go back onto religion again, but it makes you realise that we're not special. Certainly, you kind of as a human, you have this certain kind of self righteousness that you have attained this level of intelligence that no other species has. It's because you're special. No, it's just because you've got the algorithm booted into your skull, and that you can put into a bit of silicon instead mm. yeah so you'd probably yeah you'd, you'd have a bit of an existential crisis I imagine mm-hmm. uh, while we're on technology I think it's important to discuss the actual feasibility of it in the sense that you don't actually need technical knowledge for it and really uh, just an understanding that of biological systems and how their brains work so I think you mentioned on the podcast before Tom where you said we're effectively electronic circuits mm-hmm. yeah that to me that simply <laughs> infers that it's absolutely possible yeah, I mean, yeah. Th- th- there's there are people saying that it's never possible, but I like I, r- I really think it nobody is. Nobody has nobody has any evidence that it is or isn't possible because we still don't know how their brain works. But they're, they're like Scott Aronson, he's one of the computer scientists, computer scientists at MIT. He, he says that it's completely compatible with the laws of physics. So therefore, mm. why yeah, exactly. why can't that happen? Could we not evolve one? from our worm or from something else because that's how evolution that's how nature did it and you're talking about uh, yeah. developing a con- yeah. Oh, yeah can yes, you not evolve it from a simpler brain that still has this central equation to it yeah, but how long will that take we'll be I don't know we'll you can, acce- you can accelerate doing it from biological yeah means, right? because yeah, if we're okay. mimicking biology we probably mim- we might want to mimic the process by which it's going to get there yeah but by the biological by but well, I think that's method is very slow. I think it, the brain actually operates at 130 meters a second in terms of that, the transfer and storage. Which is really slow in comparison to electronics, which basically operate at the speed of light. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about an enormous difference between the rate of learning. Yeah, the biological li- limitations are just... I mean, if we're trying... Well, no, I'm talking about the evolutionary process. That's limited by the rate at which things give birth, but you can accelerate that through the clock yeah, speed so of Yeah, so if you were to simulate it... Yes, there has actually been stuff on this. You start with a pool of genetic algorithms... And okay. then you specify the environment, so you have a chaperone who determines what kind of thing traits you want to see. So if you have an environment that you want to 
uh, where you want someone to be really, really good at maths or something to be really good at maths, mm -hmm. then you do it such that the ones that aren't good at maths get eliminated and you allow the ones that remain to breed, procreate, whatever. Uh, and the, you continue doing that until you end up with a level of intelligence suitably <coughs> high for your purpose. Yeah. And so there is that approach, but then that raises the question of what's, how do you make those genetic algorithms? What goes into mm. uh, the system at the beginning to make you do so? Yeah. It sounds well. It sounds less complicated than making the fully fledged system. It's like if we can't create AI, maybe worse AI can make better AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, programming computers be computer scientists, and that again brings us back onto what Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk are worried about: is the idea of having this computer that develops itself so quickly. It would be, as I've said before, it'd be at an exponential rate. So as you get smarter, you get better at developing yourself, so you continually improve yourself more quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, you, it would be, uh, people said this before, but it would be as intelligent as us at one instant, and then in the next instant it would be hundreds upon thousands of times more intelligent than us, and you have no idea what sort of consequences we have, because we can, simply can't comprehend it by the very nature, which is, which is hilarious and absolutely terrifying. Yeah. And like pe people, when they hear that, their, their simple answer is just program it. From, from, yeah, from which you can't put some code in so that it'll stop it from doing that. Yeah, which is the, the control problem. The, the, the idea that you can write a code that is so solid and cannot, they have no um, loop kind of uh, bugs, glitches. Yeah, it. all it takes is a bug. No, no escape, <laughs> yeah. no kind of escape reason to the code that to, that you can write code that's so solid that uh, an intelligence that's so exponentially smarter than you would not be able to crack it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know how you can yeah. think that. Yeah, I think there are three or four methods in terms of controlling the intelligence of, or controlling the being that would be so many times more intelligent than us. Uh, mm. There's the kill switch method and the if statement method. So those are the ones that you're talking about there, Val, where you can simply press off. I wouldn't... I think that's a terrible idea. So if you created this button, you're not going to understand it nearly as well as this thing millions of times more intelligent than you. Again, with the if statement... I seriously doubt it's going to be as solid as you said uh, to stop the thing itself changing it. If you, if this thing this thing would probably be conscious in AGI, I think it's almost implied to an extent that it would ha be a conscious being, and I think all beings that are conscious don't want to be not conscious in yeah. the sense that you don't, you don't want to die, yeah. effectively. Yeah. Uh, and then there, the t two other methods are, the, there's a food method. So you have a particular material, um, substance, whatever, that this thing has to do in order to continue to function. Again... Well, surely I, that's just electrical power supply, isn't it? Uh, you, you could... Uh, not just an electrical power supply, so you create a specific... Obviously, this being could create things to make the electrical power supply, so you'd want to do it such that it couldn't do that. But then, again, I would say compare that to the human race and our capacity to farm. We create enough food for ourselves, or for the most part. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've we, we found methods to create this stuff. So again, I think that's not a very good method of doing that. And then the other method is to give it laws. So give it ethics and to make it understand mm -hmm. right from wrong. And this brings you on to the interesting question in ethics, which I'll try not to talk about here, but I think we perceive things that aren't good as being evil. Okay. You see what I mean? Mm hmm And that's very black and white, but there are so many things which we could see as being evil. I think the if you were to quantify the actual amount of good and the amount of evil actions possible, then your evil ones would fire out where your good ones. And in terms of intelligent being, that would eventually result in that being being perceived as evil. So you'd need to have those ethics in place to do it. Do you know anything about the... About the what? About ethics and laws. Well, you... We're doing it later. Yeah, I mean... I'll, I'll, <laughs> no, no, that's, in, that's integrally related to it. You need to have these... This is why, this is why they're advocating research into it, because you need to have technology in place to be able to give something ethics. And we're not talking about ethics themselves. We're not talking about what the programs would be. We're talking about where they're going in terms of what technologies they plan to use to do that. Oh, I, I don't know about the technology they're using to Im implement the ethics, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm very skeptical that you can write write the code, kind of that will, 
that will be the like the first line of first few lines of code that will be the ethics and that it won't be able to to change them by itself because the whole point of it <coughs> is to upgrade itself by running its own code. So why can't it change? This all code? this all sounds very scary. Why why do we want general AI? If this is going to happen, why yeah, do we? Why can't we just have lots of modular bits of AI that do that do the things that we want them to do? Because that's not general AI. That's but that yeah. AI. But we might not want maybe, from the sounds of this. It sounds pretty pretty scary. Yeah, I, I don't think we don't know what we want because we don't understand it. Yeah. Well, maybe we should think long and hard about whether general AI is actually something we need. I mean, even if the government said that you can't, you're not allowed to build this. People do. People, it. yeah. It's not going to change anything. People are going to keep on working on it. Yeah. Well, it may. Well, we say it might not even be possible. Yeah, well. but, but like we could be limited by how much we can actually do as a human race. Yeah. In terms of our cognitive thought. One thing, I don't know if it's time to talk about what we're most excited about because it's all but all a bit bleak at the moment. But I like, I, well, I was looking at chess actually, and you know that obviously like computers are great at chess. Like yeah. basically, computers can consistently be the best grandmasters every single time now. Yeah. But the best player in the world at the moment is called a centaur which is basically b- like in tandem it's a human player and a computer pl- computer like player and they work so there's, this is because probably the computer system is limited it can't do everything so the human is better in some ways it can think maybe more creatively but I think that's quite interesting about the idea of not artificial intelligence but augmented intelligence in the future whereby we have these things that can improve our memory in, in, inside our brain right, or yeah. Things that can help us. Imagine if you're an engineer who could literally just do all the calculations there and then in their head that you could you could, in, I don't know, integrate in your head. Yeah, if you have like a memory yeah. bank. So I so, think this is really exciting. So like when, when we try and remember stuff, you can just be like, "What, what was Jerome wearing three months ago when I saw him <laughs> at the yeah. dynamics lecture?" <clears throat> yeah, so it's basically accelerating just, our own evolution it just searches and stores everything like yeah like that. that's that's really good actually i think i would much rather see that implemented because it would be a way to empower the human race rather than to make it feel far weaker and be inferior yeah i agree with you entirely there but I think if you were to implement it that would be the way to do it such that humans weren't superseded but can we stop yeah. that like the AI and general AI. That, that's the best question. I mean, but do we even have to create general AI? This yeah, this is what I'm saying. It? Can you create yeah. a piece of AI like Tom was saying that that has the understanding that general AI is possible and they work together to create general AI and then you just can't, can't do anything about it? We're back onto negative things here, aren't we? <laughs> Can you create a program that does that? I don't, don't think we have enough knowledge, like technically. Yeah. Well, we I think we must have is... a fragment of knowledge. There must, but if it's possible at all, then that would mean that there is knowledge in existence at the moment, or there's. Okay, if you look at so this is knowledge mapping. Okay, so mm. say we're here and we have that really tiny fragment of knowledge of everything possible to know. Now, knowledge is all interconnected. That's a pretty big assumption of what I'm about to explain. Mm -hmm. So that would suggest that you would be able to expand out from that centre of tiny knowledge and be able to find those other things. Now, if AI is possible, which I believe it is, absolutely Mm -hmm. on the basis of the electrical circuit, perception of it, that sort of thing, then that would mean that we have enough knowledge at the moment to be able to write that line of code or whatever or to create that robot that would be able to build AI. You just need to find a proper way of, like I said before, unpacking um, like a box unfolding itself continuously and getting bigger and bigger and better and better. And which would suggest that it is possible to do that, but how the hell do you create something that creates knowledge in effect? Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like this central algorithm is almost like the DNA in life or something yeah. that it enables kind of all the other complexity. I don't know if it's that simple though. Kind of just one thing. Well, DNA is not base. simple. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, single base. No, it's really weird, isn't it? The idea that there could be that single piece of code or multiple lines of code, which all which manage to bounce bounce uh, information between them, such that they create more lines of code, which further bounce it back and forth until you end up with that system, which is an artificial intelligence or has the capacity to create one. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, but surely if you were to have an artificial, holy sh. This is uh, this is profound. So, if you had an artificial intelligence, yeah, then that artificial intelligence would 
the, say you had the computer science process, so you knew how to create the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, would that computer, if it, were, if it were to create the artificial intelligence, not just know how to do it, would it give that program the capacity to itself? In which case, it could continuously replicate itself. So you're talking procreation on a massive scale digitally. So you end up getting billions of copies of this program and then managing to bootload them into every single, uh, anything with the capacity to uh, actually operate on them. You see what I mean? So rather than being limited so by So spreading like a virus. Yeah, spreading like a virus, exactly. Which is, which would, yeah. Well, it's clear, the computer, so, yeah, it's clear that software can, can do it, can, has that way of replicating itself because viruses exist. Yeah. So, but it, makes good, it, it would propagate they, itself in a different way. But. Yeah, is uh, intelligence like that, is it a virus? Are we a virus in the sense that yeah, we're a virus? We're yeah. So yeah, then, surely this what would be the difference in the fact that the artificial intelligence yeah. that would also be a virus? Mm -hmm. But would it be a benevolent virus or a malevolent virus? Who the hell knows? Yeah. <laughs> Who the hell knows? Uh, what are your I general thoughts? I don't want your, AI. I don't like AI. AI. Yeah. Do you think it should be an augmentative technology like Tom suggests, or do you think it yeah. should be able to operate? Maybe Sandline. Maybe like maybe it's just the next stage of evolution. Like we don't need to exist anymore. If we <laughs> okay. if, next if, stage of human yeah. evolution is for no humans. We well, yeah, no, I mean we Or we all get loaded onto our we're, consciousness we're, gets loaded onto a piece of software and our bodies get discarded. That's the next stage the, of evolution. The human. technology is it's human, like we're, we're, it's coming from us. We're making ourselves. So it's sort of like our offspring, I guess. I was recreating this 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 con this conscious AI if we actually do it, um, and then maybe we just become irrelevant because we've created that and because it's so much smarter than us, we just don't need to exist anymore. And that's just the beings are those AIs. Yeah, it's no so different to just dying. Yeah. Just dying and then leaving it. That's yeah. wow. Uh -huh, but That's like, mind blowing. Yeah, see that way. When did you read that somewhere? Is that just a profound thing you can? You know, did you come over there yourself? No, there was another guy I read uh, oh, about evolution. Sorry, yeah, he, he, he was is. talking about how the evolution and stuff like that. But yeah, I don't. Okay. It's, well, positive side. What? 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 what can do you we need to in? be fleshy? Yeah, that's the question. Isn't it? I, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. I don't like. We can't stop it. There, you, you, there's no. We, we. There are people who. Like it's an ex it's an ex existential threat, like Stephen Hawking was saying, but unlike diseases like Ebola and things like that, that we're trying to squash it, we're tr uh, but this is like the reverse. It's an existential threat, but we're trying as hard as we can to create it. Yeah, <laughs> it's maybe it is just the next stage of evolution, and then, like I, I don't I don't do we need to exist anymore? Like. <laughs> That suggests there's some sort of race, there's some sort of predefined plot here, predefined purpose. No, it Wait, Wait it says, what is, should it should it no, should no, it be no, the no, yeah like is it the next stage should it be the next stage or something like it's kind of written that this is how the human race is supposed to evolve. I don't know. I like I don't I don't feel like it's, it's not that inevitable. No, I don't think. Yeah. So. Oh, well, I don't know. That's or whether a different topic altogether. Or whether, or whether it should ha or whether it should happen. I, d I well from the sounds of it, perhaps, I'm not sure. This is I'm not sure. I like the idea of 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 fully general AI. I was just connecting back to uh, religion last week yeah. about God. Uh, what's that? There's a quote by some guy. Um, what's his name? Uh, Alan Alan Harrington. Having created the gods, we can turn into the gods. Mm -hmm. That's what maybe create, that's, yeah. what creating AI that's what AI is. AI is. Maybe then, maybe God was actually a lesser being that created us, and we we're actually more superior than the original God, and we're, and we're going to be the next God of another. Oh, I love that. That is so good. <laughs> or maybe the religion, the, the, the idea of God is is a way of like remembering what we're supposed to accomplish, which is AI, of creating, yeah. of creating something that is omniscient, omnipotent, all that stuff. Oh, here we go. Why didn't we mention this last time? We should have mentioned that. Yeah, yeah no, this is, that's, th those are both incredible thoughts to think that we came from something that was actually a lesser being rather than an omnipotent being. And do you think, yeah, wow. Sorry. I'm googling that, see if anyone else has come up with it. Mm. If not, I'm writing a book on it. <laughs> <laughs> it might only need to be about three lines long or something. Uh, yeah, but what you say about uh, these artificial intelligence actually superseding us, so we have these super intelligent beings, do you think that's in alignment of what people research AI for at the moment? So people say, oh, it will improve the life for humans. 
do you think that's just look crock of shit? Uh, in the short term, it, it will, yeah, like it will improve human life. We won't have to go to war. We won't, we'll send these robots that are aren't humans, but to, to, to kind of fight for us, so you, you won't lose father. But you'll say that war will still happen. In the short term, hopefully in the long term, maybe yeah, I can help stop so war from actually AI happening. AI, artificial intelligence, diplomats. Well, yeah, I mean that, that's the idea. In the short term, like we were saying that it was Stephen Hawking, that the short term, the impact is depends on who controls the AI. <laughs> so in the short term, there will still be wars, I think, because we'll have power over the AI. Mm-hmm. So we will send them to war instead of humans. But in the long term, whether they can be controlled or not, they'll, who knows what they'll do, but. I don't. Th- I don't think. Maybe you can't think of it as like a separate being, because we, like I was saying, it, it's we're creating it ourselves. So it it is kind of our offspring. Mm-hmm. And you're so the get, whole thing is basically augmented intelligence. You're gonna you're gonna die anyway. Yeah. So it just sort of evolves over time. To do you think we could install prejudices in them? So our own prejudices in sense, not necessarily being a bigot or whatever, but having our own identity. So in the same way that a mother or father influences their children, do you think we would do that with these artificial intelligence children? Do you think people would want to do that if they knew that they had the capacity to do so? Yeah, humans would definitely do that. Everybody, I all, think so, yeah. all humans want, they want to impact other people by getting them to think the way they do. But that's that has awful connotations. If you well, so if you have a say these thing these creations were super intelligent. Yeah. Then you end up having all these people with all of the different views who which are which are frequently in conflict with one another, having creating super intelligence beings which probably have incredibly high resolution sensors and um, machine outputs which are could be have potential to be incredibly violent, then all of your AI children start fighting, and that would have terrible consequences because you'd have a genocidal robot, or it's not. I wouldn't. I don't know if robots are the right word for these sorts of things. Right, 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 right. I think I consider it to be quite disembodied as as like a cloud based <laughs> yeah. thing. Basically. What, like what if once you get to 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 certain <clears throat> intelligence that you realise that the war and stuff like that is just a waste of time. But what if it's you realise the other way? <laughs> How do you? I I don't mean to be. Yeah, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah. But what if war is the only way? What if that super intelligence being doesn't do what we would hope it would, and say prejudice is the wrong way to go, uh, bigotry is the wrong way to go, and say no, this is actually the more intelligent thing to do. And I I know as humans we perceive it differently, and personally I think it isn't the right way to go. But what if that super intelligent being decides otherwise? Maybe it is the smartest one. We're, we're talking about like <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it would be yeah. if if it were truly wholly intelligent, the most in, absolutely intelligent, then it would, make, it would be the correct decision, which seems so incredibly wrong correct, to us. Yeah. To well, to know that we were wrong about these things that we consider deep rooted morals. But it, it, can I take it back to reality? Like, if the if we have created this algorithm that exists maybe on a couple of servers worldwide, how's that then going to become something that can wield guns? Like, talk me through the process here. Because like, because it's pure... Weaponry, like, because it but how's it going to be able to create the, the physical metal bits of shit? Oh, well, you could, uh, automated processing plants. So it would, it would take, it would, if this is on a current server, this would go into some sort of automotive, well, automated factories, factory. The factories where it would take over a factory via some sort of, maybe it would take, go on the internet, take over a factory, maybe take over a couple of vehicles, mine some material, it bring it in. It this is all without humans switching anything off. But it doesn't even need to do that. because So, it do, so it's entirely virtual, there's the, no the physical... Government, the government, they, they're, they're working on trying to create AI. They want to create these robots that they can send to war. So they're going to make these robots anyway. So these are robots, Rob. These are actually physical, that are connected via well, actuators physical, well, to physical, physical bit, robots, yeah. bits of... And then upload this artificial intelligence to it so that it is conscious and it can control this robot completely free with free free range of movement, like a human. There are still doors and stuff. I, I, I don't know. I feel like they're still limited by the physical world. I don't think that. If it, are we talking about super intelligence here, or are we talking about a general intelligence? Well, we're talking still super intelligence. It's still going to exist as electrons. If it's a super intelligence, then it would easily be able to deceive us into... It would act as a puppet master in effect, if it wanted to. If it wanted to get out of sight... If it was, say, on Val's laptop at the moment, it would yeah. do something such that we took a course of action that would allow it to operate, to actuate in the physical world, so you'd be able to run. And um, regardless of what way that is, say, so if it this was... Is getting, to, it's I'm not, getting, I'm this quite isn't, This is an absurdity. 
I promise you, if you were to have something that were that intelligence, it would find a way of being able to operate in the real okay, world. Okay, so it exists only on Val's laptop. If you yeah. took out the battery and unplugged it, would it still be able to function somehow? Well, it might be able to stop you in some way. This but if is, it was, this if is if a problem with comprehending If it was already things. on and it's connected to the internet, it's already it, would, it, would, it yeah. would have uploaded itself to the internet. Yeah. And so it could access and then it Assuming it's not. Stuff, assuming so. you've not got a Wi-Fi chip. But that's, that's, first of all, that's, that's a slightly absurd assumption. But even on top of that, we, the problem is with super intelligence is that you can't... Because we aren't super intelligent, you f- it's really, can't really difficult what to comprehend what yeah. its course of action will be. This is getting too philosophical. This is getting it, too no, it isn't philosophy, though. This is, this is reasoning. So, it, so it philosophy can, it can is cha- reasoning. I'm it can sorry, change but, medium from from electrons on a piece of silicon to some sort of thing in the ether that flows around and no, starts no, permeating it's, it's, that's not brain. what we're saying though we're not saying it's in the if ether it, if, we're it's, saying... if it's on a computer okay and it, and it uploads itself to the internet and it accesses a factory where all the machines are controlled by these computers okay. by definition it will, it will but these machines control. might not have the set, the right physical architecture no, to run the software. No, find the machines that would be suitable. But, but what if there are no, they, they, they don't need then, to be suitable. They, they yes, can use the machines can, to build the machines that will allow them to build the thing they want to build. When they exist as that is super intelligent program, then they can reprogram the existing systems within that manufacturing Exactly. Program. So but what if the humans take itself? away all the metal so they but can't they build any robots? The humans, this is the point, because it's super intelligent, it would be able to completely deceive human interaction if it wanted to. But it's not... It's, the creating the AI is not something you can like prepare for and say, I'll just turn it on. Yeah. Like I think it's gonna be where you can just create it by accident and it's gonna exist and you're gonna be like, oh shit, it exists. Yeah, so it's like you know in MATLAB when you run a line of code again and again and keep on getting errors and then you don't. It'll be like that, except when you don't get the error, you effectively you if it's a super intelligence, you've effect you're screwed instant. At that instant that you press run, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. It will acknowledge almost immediately that humans are mistrusting and that it's not it's the if the AI wants to preserve itself, then it will immediately upload itself to the internet and distribute itself all over the planet in order for it not to be erased. And then it will go about continuously in finding other ways to ensure it doesn't get erased. Assuming that that that, that self preservation is central to consciousness. Well yeah. It's a crazy yeah. thing. We, we might it not is, want it it's to... It's so difficult to comprehend. Does it have to be conscious in order to be intelligent, if we bring it back to the definition? Well, if you're emulating human intelligence... Do we want to, you, do we want to, emulate, do we want to emulate human thought? Because human thought isn't perfect. Do we actually want to emulate the way in which humans thought, with, think with conscien- consciousness, with prejudice, with bias? Like, is that actually how it's going to end up? Because we're, we're still a stage in evolution. We're not the end point. But we can't base intelligence of anything else the only but if it evolves naturally it might evolve beyond that and it might not actually require a consciousness it might even go through human intelligence this is one of the things I was thinking about last night uh, was we assume that development in intelligence is a linear thing so you have point A and you have point B and you have a straight line between them mm. now h- human intelligence may be somewhere along there but rather than going along that straight line this computer may wave right off round to the side go completely the other way and end up at that point where we don't recognise that it's surpassed human intelligence yeah <laughs> you look exhausted. I, I, I'm, I've, I've gotten ill. Oh, you're uh, feeling lethargic. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, if we t- if uh, we're going to talk more about this ethics up next time, do you want to talk about like where it's going to go in the next? This this seems like quite long far off. What do you think about the next ten years or so? What's going to happen? Well, a prediction. The biggest that thing that's going to happen. You're not like, going to get general AI in the next ten years. No, no. I, well, I've said augmented How intelligence is quite. An, who, who the heck? Like what? Oh, absurd no. Absurd confidence on very little knowledge. <laughs> Why, like, <laughs> human trade. Well, the, the predictions of Ray, okay. Ray Kurzweil. 2029. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, no, it's 2025. No, no, no. Yeah, the, yeah, that's the Moore's yeah. versus... 2029, uh, by 2029, um, computer intelligence will exceed human intelligence, is his prediction. Mm, that's, okay. that's the singularity. If it, was that, if it was that bloody intelligent, it'd be able to surpass time, and it would already exist, and it would already be controlling us, and it's the Matrix right Wait, now. you assume that time is possible to manipulate? <laughs> which it, and it runs in one direction. It's, it's, I really don't think time travel is possible. <laughs> in which case, the artificial intelligence would still... Yeah, and it'd be able to manipulate the laws of physics. If it, was, if it was intelligent enough to uh, hop from one computer to... to I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting ridiculous. Anyway, next next big thing. Like, if we if we... Next big thing, yeah. I think you're just going to continue seeing these pre-existing see, yeah. application-specific programs becoming more closely integrated. So you think something that looks kind of like AGI, but isn't it? You won't have true AGI until I say my prediction will be twenty forty, okay. if at all. 
Okay. I don't know. Like you, you, we, we make we can't make these predictions. We have. No, I know we can't make these predictions. It's interesting. It's interesting to say. Yeah, it's interesting to say. Yeah. I mean, I, us three have absolutely. Come on. No I know we have no idea, but it'll be interesting thinking about it when you say fifty or forty or whatever. That listening means, back. Listening, back, listening thing, back, and then you're like, "What did I say back then? I was so far off. I was dead on." There you go. Come on, yeah, make yeah. a prediction. Make a prediction. I don't care what the number is. Twenty thirty. Before okay. general AI exists and it will take a kind of wait, linear path. Wait, wait, general AI as in it will exceed human intelligence. It will no, not mm, it's, that's, that's not general intelligence. AGI is um, simu- emulating, not simulating. So it'll be like a, like us. Yes. Conscious. Uh, con- if you if consciousness is intrinsically related to intelligence, which we'll discuss next week, then yeah, sure. Uh, okay, yeah, twenty thirty. Ray Kurzweil seems to know what he's doing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This Tom, is ge- this say? is of the same level, the same he- thinking capacity. I'd say I, okay. I'll say twenty thirty as well. But I'd say that full, fully general, super intelligent AI. I think we. I don't think we'll ever create that because I. Don't, I think the will. I don't think it will quickly follow. I don't think. I don't think that'll happen. So what are we saying? The difference between AGI and super. Super intelligence exceeds human capacity for thought, whereas AGI is emulation. Of <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get to the okay. stage where right. it controls the world, personally. I don't think it's going to happen. I, th- I think super intelligence will happen. I think we'll And you think it's going to be shit? Do you think it's going to go bad? Because we've not talked about any good implications of this. perspective of it, but I mean, in terms of the grand scheme of things, it's probably a better thing. But, you it know. depends what bad means. Like, if, 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 yeah, if, if, if the bad is that we're going to go, humans are going to go extinct, like biological humans are going to go extinct, then I think that's probably what's going to happen, but is that necessarily bad? So you think this is going to happen? There, okay. This is, is a there bit bad and good things <laughs> in the universe. There are perceptions of them, so if you have a super intelligent being, surely that would be recognised that, unless you had those things built into it, where it recognised what we thought was bad and good, but then then your paradox is within what we think is bad and good. So I'm, but talk, how, but I'm talking from so. a human perspective here. From a, but then human perspective varies so widely on that. <laughs> the human perspective, like, the the humans want to be alive and happy. In, no, in general. Uh, do we, well, well, we in don't have to be happy with it. Like, if we're just. If, Can if, we leave this till next time? If they don't we attack will. us or anything, is it just sort of we die down over time and AI the number of AIs increases so it's sort of like a gradual change okay. you understand so yeah. it's not like they'll kill us all but <laughs> it's just we, we start to die off because we have no use we have no we don't need to be exist anymore yeah well, you guys are both quite bleak. Hopefully next time I'll, I'll argue a slightly more... I, I really don't perceive it as being bleak. I think I agree with Val on this. If we do it's get to next... that super intelligent stage... Yeah, what's, what's that guy, the... Um, Mi- is it Michio Kaku? Uh, the physicist, yeah. Yeah, is, is it, that's the name, Michio? I think so. Mich- I know it's Kaku, I can't, I can't remember the first name. He says that that's relating to the Fermi's paradox, why we haven't seen other species, that perhaps... You you over time you you t- want to explore space, but then you get to a point where you realize that the true exploration is within yourself. So you kind of reverse. You you you, you expand outwards, and then you expand. You, you kind of contract back inwards. So you, you you don't exist biologically anymore. You just exist. so are we at that point where we're starting to get contract inwards again? Would you say? Uh, I don't think we've explored well, far no. enough outwards. So yeah, we have But we, yeah. we can do them simultaneously. There's, uh, in Ray Kurzweil in his book, he talks about the, e- the different stages of the epochs. I don't know if you've heard of them. So e- epoch one was the idea that first physics and chemistry existed. But you could store information in atoms. And then epoch two was DNA and biology and basic life started existing. And then three was information stored in brains and neurons. Okay. And then uh, Epoch 4, which is where we are now, is technology. So information is stored in, in um, technology, basically, like uh, computers, things like that. And then e- Epoch uh, 5 is where the merging of biology and technology into one thing. So the symbi- symbiosis of machines and man, which is mm-hmm. what we we're, were talking about earlier. How yeah. uh, AI will just... We'll evolve over time to the point where we're not any, we're not useful anymore. Yeah. Lovely. And then you end up with them. Okay. Yeah, and then the last one is that uh, you can influence matter using nanotech and biotech. Look, I love that. This is exhausting. Again. Yeah, it is. I really enjoy the conversations, but fucking hell, they aren't tiring. Um. 
Do you... Well, do you want to... Well, I think we're pretty much done for today. Yeah, we'll have any concluding remarks. Right. Well, my person... Okay. Let's let's define my personal view again. We'll go around. My personal view is that I think we're going to... We're going to get to a certain point that we're not going to go beyond. And I don't think this sort of super intelligence is going to exist. Personally, I think we're going to get to augmented uh, intelligence that's going to help us. We're going to get application-specific AI, and we're not going to get general AI. We might get something that we could say has the same computation power and, and reasoning as a human brain, but it's not a human brain, because it's not conscious. I would say consciousness is fully possible. We are a prime example of this. It's clearly possible, and by the laws of physics, as you said earlier, Val, therefore it's, we will be able to do it, and once we do that, we would hopefully be able to, or hopefully, question mark, uh, be able to understand that, and then we would be able to optimise particular processes within that intelligence, such that you would be able to develop super intelligence, which I don't know if it's a good thing from, I don't think it's a good thing from a human perspective, but in the grand scheme of things, in inverted commas, it might be better, but probably not. Val. <laughs> uh, I think it, it is possible, uh, well, if we're defining the super intelligence to the point where it exceeds human intelligence, I think that's going to happen. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Perhaps, like I was saying, maybe it's just sort of the next stage where, like, we 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 try and so you, when people have cho children, they try and make sure they get better education, that they're smart, so that they're smarter and can be more successful than their their parents. So our offspring is, say, AI that is smarter than us, and then maybe we just don't need to exist anymore. Excellent. <laughs> well, well, we'll be back next time with a bit of ethics, won't we? Yeah. And it's going to get much worse.